Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Joris Ray resigns, the Shelby County Clerk is on vacation, and much more tonight on Behind the Headlines. Barnes with the Daily Memphian. Thanks for joining us. I am joined tonight by a round table of journalists to talk about the biggest stories of the week. Abigail Warren from the Daily Memphian. Thanks for being here again. Thanks for having me. Toby Sells from the Memphis Flyer. Thank you for being here again. Thank you, sir. Along with Bill Drees, reporter with the Daily Memphian. Uh, we were joking before we start, how can it only be Thursday when we're taping this um, and there's already been so much news? The biggest news, though, would seem to be, uh, as of this moment, was Joris Ray uh, resigning, or in, uh, put another way, the school board uh, voted to accept his resignation after uh, the beginnings of an investigation into impropriety. Uh, Daily Memphian uh, first broke the story that there was accusations of Joris Ray um, having sexual relations with uh, employees who worked for him at, at uh, Memphis Shelby County Schools, it was probably Shelby County Schools at that time, uh, back before he was superintendent. Um, they worked out some sort of settlement this week, it looks like, Toby, um, but there's still a whole lot of, I mean, there, the, one has the sense that the Shelby County, or the Memphis Shelby County School Board would like to have taken this vote, settled the issue, and they want to move on, but I think there are just a lot more questions. That seems to be the, the only answer uh, is, is, you know, doing things efficiently, moving on to find somebody else. Uh, they gave him, what was it, $480,000 severance package, nearly five, nearly half a million dollars to walk away from this. And the questions that I'm just seeing online is uh, people are saying, well, if he broke the, the terms of his contract by doing this, why on earth do we owe him that money? Maybe that's kind of a hot take. I'm sure there's a lot of details. Uh, in that contract and a lot of things that the lawyers worked out. But, you know, the only thing I could think that the school board gets from this is, is that efficiency. They can move quicker to fill the role and, and get things rolling for the next, uh, the next school year. I don't know. It, Bill, your, your take, it, it does seem like, I mean, I think many people will be glad to, to have George Ray given the, the, the behavior out of there, but still a whole lot of questions about how this happened the, I mean, maybe it was you who had said, or I can't remember who told me, the school board has one employee, the superintendent, mm -hmm. and then the rest of the employees work for the superintendent. There's one employee. How did, how did they not know when, that this was going on? There had been an investigation of Joris Ray back before he was hired. It's just many more questions to get answered. Yeah, and, and, and it gets into the, into the history of really how this works. And, and it, as we've chronicled, it is a very turbulent um, history of picking superintendents and, and, and who has been picked. Um, in, in this case, uh, you had a search firm, and, and, and that's the first big debate of this whole thing, search firm or no search firm, citizens committee or no citizens committee, just go local with someone in, in the system. I don't think you're going to see that this time uh, because w what you had with Joris Ray and with Willie Harrington before him, several superintendents before him, were, were bona fide uh, campaigns to stay local in selecting a, a superintendent. Uh, in, in, in Harrington's case, the school board had actually made a decision to hire someone from outside the school system who, when he looked at the controversy, just said, nope, don't want the job because of that. And then Harrington became, became superintendent uh, a, a role that he had effectively been serving in for at least a year before John Freeman retired and he became superintendent. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, 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 there are a lot of questions. Uh, the, the half a million dollars settlement, I, I, I think, boils down to does the school system want to be tangled up in court negotiating mm -hmm. this? Should Ray choose to contest uh, the school board using those grounds to just basically fire him with no kind of severance at all. Yeah, Abigail, your take on all this. For me, the most interesting thing was that they ended the investigation and the investigation wasn't over when mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ray did decide to resign. Um, so, you know, when you look at his contract, I'm pretty sure if you fire him, there has to be cause for it, but the investigation wasn't over and so there wasn't um, reason for that. So he did resign, um, but that the investigation wasn't over and they ended the investigation was just kind of a, 
sign that they were ready to move on. Yeah, I mean, and I don't think they should be, I mean, bluntly allowed to move on. I mean, I think, I mean, the public paid for the investigation. Those, I mean, there could be details that have to be redacted. I get that. Names of victims. I mean, I, I get that. There's a certain amount of privacy in this. But this is a public official sure. who wanted this job, who's paid by the public. This, the investigation was paid by the public. It seems like whatever they found clearly wasn't going, in, I mean, you can only be left to assume that it wasn't going in a good direction. So they said, hey, resign, please. We'll accept that resignation. We won't fight you in court, as Bill said. But that, that shouldn't end it in a, in a private company? Maybe. I don't know. But this is a public position. I agree. Uh, you know, we need to know what happened, and uh, you can't just let a public official off the hook like that. Uh, to, to whatever end, if they, if they figure out that, uh, you know, innocence or guilt or, or whatever they yeah. came up with, we deserve answers, I think, and, and hopefully down the road we'll get some. I was going to mention here uh, that on the day of the resignation, uh, Ray took to Twitter, uh, thanking his staff for you know all the years that he'd served there, uh, pointed out a lot of his uh, uh, achievements there, African American male empowerment, uh, third grade commitment plan to you know raise the, the reading level, uh, universal screener assessment for the Clue program, uh, just academic advancements, access for all to different things, the rebranding project that was a little bit controversial there in the day, paying teachers a living wage. Uh, and at the end of it, he, he ended with a quote from the Bible that said, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So uh, maybe, there's a, maybe there's a chapter two here for, for George Ray. I, well, yeah, Bill. I, I, I think, uh, first of all, it's, it's important to remember that, that this began as what was essentially a, a public record. The divorce decree right. in, in his case spelled this out. Sometimes divorce filings are not public. Sometimes they are sealed, usually when children are involved. In, in this case, they weren't. The other point to remember is the investigation was, it was not going to be limited to just what happened or what was alleged in the divorce filing. So it, it could have been a broader investigation. We, we don't know if that will ever come out. I, I, I can tell you in, in, in terms of our reporting, there are public records requests yeah. that have been made right. for those Fantastic. records. Yeah. And, and again, I think everybody in town, I mean, I hope, I mean, that who covers the school system or covers, you know, uh, public education should continue to pursue it. Because, you know, if there's a culture of, of not um, good management, of not good policies in place, and, and you've got a person of power um, who is abusing that, or if, if that's not what happened, then George Ray's name should be cleared. That's and, right. and what happened should be you know, put out there. Um, and you're right, Toby, to bring up some of the successes that, he, that he, he, he points to. And so just this unfinished question, and it, you know, with a new, what, about half the school board it will be new coming in when they're seated, because we just went through an election, about, uh, what, three or we four We went through an election for four of the, yeah. of the of So the they're going to, you can just feel them wanting to say, you know what, that was in the past, that was a lot of older board members, we want to move forward. But again, it's huge dollars. It's what, however many tens of thousands, 90,000 kids in the system and families and so on. Just too many questions that it seems to me that still have to be pursued, not just for the news value and the, maybe the, the, you know, the, the details and so on, but because it is a, a, such a prominent public uh, institution. Well, let's move on. We're going to come back to some of the some education stuff, but I think the other big story this week is is the Shelby County Clerk Wanda Halbert. Um, there has been just a litany of problems around license plates, around getting tags to people. Um, she was just reelected by pretty handily, uh, uh, I think, by by all standards. Um, then you may have to walk me through the timeline here, Bill, of what right. has happened and where <laughs> um, we are as of Thursday morning. Wanda Halbert, the, the Shelby County Clerk, the office that is best known for, for issuing you your license plates when there are new ones and renewing your tags once every year, uh, but who has other functions in that office as well. Um, this backlog really started in April. The, that was when we did our first story on it based on what we were seeing on social media posts from people complaining about it. Uh, and it intensified in May through June, got, got much worse. Um, right before the election, Wanda Halbert announced that her office had caught up on this backlog, which had been thousands of license plates and tags. Announced that, that her office had caught up on that but that her office would be closed down for two weeks, the week we're currently in right now, 
and another separate week in September to catch up on a backlog in other areas that the clerk's office handles because it had been, in effect, all hands on deck to resolve the backlog with the license plates and, and the tags. So this week begins and the Tennessee Controller's Office has, has already been contacted by the Shelby County Commission with county commissioners who, who called in a bipartisan vote, I might add, for the state to investigate ways to possibly help the clerk's office or have some oversight of the clerk's office. Um, as the shutdown began this week, the office closed to the public. The controller's office said, we have confirmed that the clerk is in Jamaica on vacation as the shutdown begins. And the state controller, Jason Mompower, actually used the phrase AWOL in referring to yeah. Halbert's absence from this. Um, keep in mind that, that Halbert had, has said from the beginning of this that she personally was helping her staff stuff the envelopes in the office, that that's how much of an all hands on deck response this was. And there were some county commissioners who said, well, maybe that's part of the problem. We put money in your budget to hire people. Those positions have not been filled. So, you know, and, and you've returned money in your budget to that that you haven't used. So maybe you're not running the office the best way. Yeah, I, I would point out, I don't you know, want to be self-promotion of, of Daily Memphian, but Otis Sanford, who uh, contributes to WKNO and contributes a column to the Daily Memphian, um, wrote in utterly scathing column this last week about really Wanda Halbert. And, you know, and Otis, Otis is, you know, people think of Otis as a, an opinion person, and he is now, but Otis was for decades um, a, a journalist and an editor, and, you know, he, he lays out a really just a terrible uh, picture of what's going on in that office and that it's not just the license plates. And I, I do encourage people concerned about this because there is so much that business licenses, marriage licenses, a lot of tax revenue, um, liquor licenses and such in unincorporated Shelby County. There's a whole lot. I mean, the Shelby County Clerk's Office is, is meant to be a nonpartisan, not particularly political office. It's kind of the, 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 the boring but important business of the county. Right. Um, and you can't help but think, I'm going to turn to Abigail for some you know thoughts on this, primarily covering Collierville and Germantown, and you can just feel somewhere with the state getting involved, some legislator, uh, probably from the suburbs, <laughs> beginning to draft uh, a bill that if the state can't, you know, take over the, uh, the, the county clerk's office as of yet, you can imagine a bill coming forward early in the session in January that, that if, if things aren't getting better, the state is going to step in. Yeah, I think that's always possible. Um, the state does look for ways to step in. Um, it's been something that they've looked at with, you know, TVA and MLG and W with that. There, um, there's already talk of legislation and what that looks like. So I think it's very possible that the state could step in. But even um, when Bill wrote about the um, vote of no confidence that Shelby County Commission gave, um, Mark Billingsley, who's from the suburbs, gave um, he had some thoughts on it and was very public about. Um, his disappointment that the state had to come in. So, um, yeah, in the suburbs, there's just as much um, frustration as there is okay. in the city. Any, any more, from Toby, anyone? Yeah, I think uh, Otis was right on. I read the column uh, this week, and uh, and his frustrations are the frustrations, I think, of everybody across Shelby County that, that deals with this. Uh, and, and as he points out in there, uh, if you're an adult, you're gonna have to go to this office. Usually for one thing is to get that driver, you know, get that license yeah. plate. Uh, there and as people on the internet said, you had one job, uh, really, the, the way people see uh, the, the clerk's office over there and she didn't do it. That uh, column was scathing. I wanted to read here uh, Mumpower's official statement from the state that came out on Twitter earlier this week. It said, uh, talk about scathing, the clerk's trip shows a lack, trip, trip to Jamaica, shows a lack of leadership and concern for her staff who are left to address the backlog without her presence in the office. It goes on, but uh, the, the words from uh, Mumpower here, it says, uh, shows that her apologies were meaningless and her decision to take a trip damages her credibility and shows a complete lack of awareness. The clerk is AWOL while her staff is left behind trying to clean up the mess. And now I know after a lot of this has come out, there's been talk of a recall, how would that work? Uh, what are other ways to potentially uh, take over the office or do things? And I think the word is we couldn't have a recall vote until, well, like six months after the election. It's, it's 180 days. Okay. Yeah. And then you would have to get a petition of, what, 15% of people in the county, which is 80,000-something uh, signatures on this thing, and then have another special election to do that. So I don't know what's in the cards over there, but I know people are angry. Yeah. 
Um, speaking of uh, people angry at politicians, I guess that's the segue. Uh, I, just a quick note that former Tennessee House Speaker Republican uh, Glenn Casada, his former chief of staff, pled not guilty after they were indicted on 20 counts each, uh, charged with eight counts of bribery, six counts of honest services wire fraud, two counts of bribery and kickbacks, much more. The, it, the charges also include theft from programs uh, uh, around federal funds, conspiracy to commit money laundering, um, fictitious name to carry out a fraud. So I, I don't want us just to focus on our local problems, wow. but also at the state, um, which does like to come in and tell us how, you know, Memphis and Shelby County, how to do things, Nashville included, the cities included. Right. Um, there's certainly plenty of problems up there. You know, before we leave the, the Halbert situation, yeah. I did want to say that, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of other internet chatter on, on uh, the different cities' subreddits, you know, the Knoxville subreddit, the Nashville subreddit, and people will post this story about the Halbert situation here, and there's a lot of shake my head, and that's Memphis, and these people see this, and they see that she was elected by more than 10,000 votes in the last election, and they walk away with this perception of Memphis that we're this yeah. second-rate, immature, can't get our stuff together city, and that we want these politicians that act yeah. this way, and that's okay. And and people need to know that is the perception that people around the state have. Yeah. Well, I, I would be quick to add, and we've noted it before, that, that this state has a history of such things uh, that are that are way outside of Memphis, and uh, I, I will go to a state legislator uh, in the 1980s who was reelected from his jail cell while yep. he was serving a sentence for tax evasion. <laughs> right. That so, was not a Memphis problem, right? No, that <laughs> was not. That, that was not. Yes. Yes. Um, we will segue into about 10 minutes left here. Um, uh, Suburban elections, uh, we just had this big election locally, but we've got the November elections coming up, including uh, a number of important races in the suburbs. Right, and um, Bartlett and Lakeland are um, kind of interesting as both their mayors are stepping down. Uh, Josh Roman, who's running for mayor in Lakeland, is unopposed, so um, that's interesting to see that he's the mayor, um, essentially, um, come November. Germantown Mayor Mike Palazzolo is unopposed. Um, as well as Alderman Marianne Gibson um, is unopposed. So it's interesting to see some of the unopposed races, but I think the one to watch is going to be the Bartlett mayor race as Mayor Keith McDonald is stepping down after 20, about 20 years in office. And so really it's a change of leadership there um, because Mark Brown, who's been their city manager for many years, is also stepping down when Mayor McDonald steps down and then also in Lakeland they have a new town manager or a new city manager out there and so really it's kind of this change of leadership and yeah. um, the passing of the torch because while the mayor is important the city manager is the one that runs the day-to-day -day operations of the town and so that's really a big a big deal that um, not only the mayor's leaving, but also they're having that change in leadership inside their and city halls. You and I next week, uh, we pre-taped it, but uh, uh, had a conversation with James Llewellyn, the long time, 27 years as city administrator of Collierville, talking about you know how its city goes from what it was 10 or 15,000 when he started as city administrator, it's now 50, it's continuing to grow. And when you talk about Lakeland, and we talked about this with James Llewellyn uh, on next week's show, um, you think about Lakeland, Arlington, Bartlett, they are primed for potentially explosive growth as a part of the whole Ford plant and, and all the attendant um, uh, suppliers and other companies are going to go in up at the mega site or Blue Oval City. Um, I still call it the Memphis <laughs> mega site. And while, while yeah. they are, there is a lot of um, economic development is very competitive. And so I know that uh, Germantown and Carville are also looking for ways. They believe people will drive to yeah. from Germantown and Carville to um, the mega site just because of the amenities that they offer and yeah. so if there's something you want in Carrierville that maybe it's the schools or something else um, yeah I think they'll benefit from it too but yes Bartlett Lakeland Arlington will see um, direct impact um, we'll move on to um, uh, again speaking of elections Steve Mulroy um, is the new district attorney um, will be in office next week is September that first. September 1st we've reached out to his office and hope to have him on uh, we had him on as a candidate with Amy Wyrick, Wyrick the outgoing district attorney but it's a whole shift there he's you know he's got what some 12 so far about 12 new uh, attorneys to hire. He's named his transition team that inc includes everyone from the police chief from Germantown to the, fo the the criminal justice reform folks from Just City. Van Turner's running that transition. And against the backdrop of, and I think you're doing a story um, on this, and maybe we are as well, bail reform. Right. And it's a whole new era of, in a time when crime is way up, 
we've got in the district attorney and over in the juvenile court judge in very, very different philosophies of crime. And in some, it's unrelated, I think, to this bail reform change, but it is a kind of marker of a different approach to crime. That's right. Uh, this A lot of this started back in December when uh, there were advocacy groups, uh, Just City, the Wharton Law Firm, ACLU, some others, uh, threatened to sue the city or sue the county if we didn't change our, our bail system here. They went through a mediation process. They came out on the other side with a new standing bail order that's supposed to be, uh, I was told, is going to be uh, uh, unveiled this week. And that's going to look like... Uh, you know, if uh, within 12 hours of somebody going to jail, they will be reviewed. They'll all their information go through a calculator to say, well, you can afford this much bail, you can't afford this much, and then within uh, 48 hours, they'll have a, a bail hearing where their attorney will be present, the prosecutor, and a judicial official will be uh, present too to say, okay, we've looked at all this. This is what we think needs to happen. We're going to set no bail. We're going to set a lower bail, or we're going to set an unaffordable bail for you to keep you here to ensure that you come back for your court date. Uh, Josh Splicker with Just City said this was, you know, really big news, and he said that this new bail order that we have here is uh, going to be the best in Tennessee, probably in the country. Uh, and all of that was kind of happening as the Mulroy campaign was going along. So it's a bit of just good timing on their part as Mulroy comes in. One of his responsibilities will be to meet in this new courtroom, this new $2 million courtroom, uh, to talk about how we're going to set bail, what we're going to do with these individuals. Um, and they're going to take every individual as they come. So uh, kind of a brand new, brand new day. Um, with just a couple of minutes left, I wanted to come back. You, uh, Abigail, were part of a really great, again, I'm, I'm touting Daily Memphian too much today probably, but and we'll talk about some of the stuff Flyers doing and other people doing great work too, but you did uh, parts of the story on the third grade reading cliff, the third grade retention policy, which retention is a very benign word for holding back third graders um, across Tennessee who don't hit certain standards on their TCAP tests. It kicks in this uh, spring. If kids don't hit the numbers, there's, they can potentially go into tutoring and summer programs to get their numbers up. But David Waters did a number of, of kind of a deep look at the history of these in other states. And there's a lot of risks. It's, we can say it's a well-intentioned bill that was passed by the state, but some 50,000 third graders every year across the state do not pass that test. And it's a, there's, holding back sounds good because everyone wants kids to read, but David and, and you and your stories uh, raised a lot of questions about the real damage it can do to kids and the history in other states and other communities of holding back third graders, holding back any elementary school kid is not a magic bullet, a magic elixir for solving the problems. But talk about, you, you mostly have been writing about the suburbs getting very worried about what this could mean. Right. Last night I was sitting in a work session in Germantown and Jason Manuel, the superintendent out there, raises the issue that the number one reason kids drop out of high school is because they were retained in an, early, in an earlier grade. Mm -hmm. It's not because they can't read. Um, and there's also a question about TCAP is a standards-based assessment. It's not a literacy test. And so um, when, you, when they do a test like the STAR, which is kind of a national literacy test, when you look at that, really Germantown has about 94, Germantown, I'm singling out, but they have like 94% of their um, students are reading on grade level, which is great. Then you do the standards-based assessment, which is different, the TCAP, and they get it back and they've only got 75% of their kids who scored. And that was the highest in the state. So that means that's one-fourth of their third graders that could be held back. So the suburbs especially are really pushing um, communication. They're meeting with parents. A lot of them did test their second graders to kind of see where who those students are but it's one day it's one test so if a child has a rough morning at home that could impact their test and then they may have to go to this summer camp but also there's concerns about when they get the scores the timing of when they get the scores you know parents plan summer vacation so they may plan to go to the beach and their child has to go to this mandatory summer camp okay so they've got to stay with grandma grandpa or they have to cancel this trip that they've had for a year um, so the timing of when you find out, it's just, there are a lot of questions um, still, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what those numbers look like when the data does come out. And we had some folks on from Memphis Shelby County Schools some months ago, some of the, the folks who work under former uh, Superintendent Ray, talking about this, and they've got money, and they've got a plan, and they're really focused on this, but it, you know, I mean, hopefully the, the, the distraction of George Ray leaving doesn't uh, hit that too much. The other things that David uh, Waters, who wrote a, a lot of this, brought up were issues around, I mean, most kids who do really do struggle to read have learning disabilities, and not all school systems are set up to work with kids with learning disabilities. There's 
there's a lot of social emotional. I mean, no one wants to make excuses for the schools or the, the kids who can't read, but it's, it's kind of a lot. With just a minute left, what you've got a big mental health piece coming out in the flyer this week? Yeah, it's on the stands right now. Uh, it's called It's Okay to Not Be Okay. Our Chris McCoy uh, talked to a lot of mental health professionals all across Memphis to find out that we had a mental health crisis on the globe, especially after COVID. Uh, there's not nearly enough therapists in Memphis to handle what we're doing. If you find one, they're not going to take insurance. They're all private pay now. Uh, but the state, uh, Governor Lee and the legislature allocated $560 million uh, for mental health services in Tennessee. That means that, you know, rates for Medi Medicaid payments are going to go up and hopefully more help is on the way. But it's an important piece, a really well-written piece. Go check it out. Yeah. And Bill, right before the show, dropped a factoid on us that blew us away. Um, yes, and this kind of got overlooked on election night because election returns came, came late here. Uh, J.B. Smiley, Memphis City Council member who ran for the uh, Democratic primary for governor with Jason Martin, who wound up winning that race statewide and is the Democratic challenger to Bill Lee. Uh, the margin in that race was 1,400. That's crazy. That's uh, amazing. amazing. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for joining us again next week. James Llewellyn, the longtime uh, town administrator from Collierville. If you missed any of the show today, you can go to uh, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. You can also go to WKNO.org, Daily Memphian. You can go to YouTube. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.